Yes. All right. You are currently in workshop number two, Body on the Line with a Sign. This workshop series is a collaboration between Make Yourself Useful and Acre, both in Chicago. Make Yourself Useful is a small collective focused on anti-racist work with an emphasis on the active role of people with white privilege within movements for racial and social justice. ACRE stands for Artists Cooperative Residency and Exhibitions and is perhaps best known for a yearly summer residency for artists in Steuben, Wisconsin. MYU is a collective, ACRE is a tiny nonprofit. All our work here is voluntary and unpaid. We are not experts, quote unquote, but have experimented, fucked up, studied, and occasionally done a few things right. NYU and Acre are scrappy and conversational versus institutional and academic. Neither of these things are better than the other, but we do not speak with authority on these matters and think it is important to own that outright. We are here tonight to humbly share our knowledge, what we have learned over the past six plus years of engaging both formally and informally in the movement for Black Lives. We come from an ethic that believes in the urgency of racial justice work, that leadership in these movements is most effective when held by those most affected, and that those who benefit from inherited unjust systems like racism have a moral and spiritual duty to act in opposition. This workshop is designed to give you some tactical strategies to effectively support Black-led movements for liberation. In this effort, we hope to also empower all of us to better act on our values of justice and liberation for all. Um, so just a quick intro um, to your co-pilots um, this evening. I'm Latham, um, I use he and they pronouns. Um, I'm an artist, I live in Chicago. I've been working with Make Yourself Useful for about six years. And my name is Gwyneth. I go by she or they pronouns. And I'm an artist mostly making work about sensations and human patterns. And I teach teenagers in Chicago. And I've been involved with Make Yourself Useful for almost two years. Okay, it's a lot of setup, but now we are <laughs> officially entering body on the line with the sign. Um, and this is a workshop about physical protest. Um, so it, it will give you a few um, tactical tools to participate on the ground um, in the 2020 uprising and beyond. Um, this is also a kind of a crossover episode um, for sitcom fans out there. Um, with some very special guest stars. Um, so we welcome David and Ellen of Extinction Rebellion Chicago, um, who you'll be spending some time with, um, and uh, they'll be walking us through an abbreviated version of their nonviolent direct action training, um, as well as inviting you all to their more extended version of that. Um, and then after that, um, we have the pleasure of uh, welcoming artist Anders Zanikowski, who will be um, guiding us through some simple protest art making tips, um, so that no matter um, what, you'll have something to bring to the protest. All right, so uh, we want to start with this quote from Angela Davis. Um, when you talk about a revolution, most people think violence without realizing that the real content of any kind of revolutionary thrust lies in the principles, in the goal that you're striving for, not in the way you reach them. On the other hand, because of the way this society is organized, because of the violence that exists on the surface everywhere, you have to expect that there are going to be such explosions. You have to expect things like that as reactions. So we wanted to share this quote to kind of just make a note here um, that we don't think that nonviolent direct action is the only um, proper strategy of protest. When faced with systemic racist violence, self-protection in whatever form it takes is a completely valid response. Um, and another note on this, um, for folks who commend peaceful protests and then criticize rioting and looting, um, you know, we believe that property damage is not remotely of the same level as state sanctioned murder. Um, so as folks with white privilege, when other folks with white privilege make disparaging and racialized comments about rioting or looting, um, it is an opportunity to engage them in dialogue um, and challenge them on their beliefs. So we, we really do encourage you um, to question and engage with loved ones, coworkers, family, friends who get, um, 
who get more upset about buildings getting messed up than people getting killed by police. And on this note, we uh, one of the workshops in this series, um, I believe it's the next one, is, a, is kind of precisely about facilitating these kinds of conversations with um, our loved ones, so. Yes, stay tuned. So another quote, uh, this time from Ben O'Keefe in Vox. A white person's job at a protest isn't to spray paint Black Lives Matter on a building. It's not to destroy stuff. It's not to loot stores. Their job is not to mess with the cops and throw stuff. Their job at that protest, what they are there to do is to do everything they can in their power to put their bodies between the bodies of Black people and police. Um, and another um, contextualizing quote for tonight. I have no problem with white people being out in the streets demonstrating alongside black folks and other people of color, so long as they are taking their cues from others and not driving the action. A white person saying, I can't breathe at a protest when they are essentially at zero risk of ever enduring a police chokehold is not a particularly meaningful act. It is a centering of the white self that at least partly dislodges focus from the matter at hand, black safety from the police. Um, and, you know, I wanted to bring in this image, which I'm sure many of you have seen, um, shared by the Kentucky National Organization for Women, um, of a bunch of seemingly white women um, holding a line uh, between police and protesters. Um, and also, I just think this is a really funny um, name here that I'm circling. I love Amsterdam XXX is in this picture. All right, and so Black Lives Matter protest etiquette and best practices for white and non-black folks. You are there as support and in solidarity. It's not about you. Don't provoke or antagonize police beyond tactical coordinated protests like direct actions, which we'll talk about tonight, led by protest organizers. Leave space for black rage and sorrow. Don't police the words or tones of those most affected. Ask for permission to capture and post photographs of people. Don't lead chance, but do follow, amplify, keep time, clap along. Point any inquiring journalists toward movement leaders, especially young, queer, femme, trans, disabled leaders. Um, representation still and always matters. Amplify, don't hijack the message. Be accountable for your actions. We all make mistakes. Follow the directions of movement leadership, including if Black only or by POC only space is needed and it's time for everyone else to head out. And stay involved after the event is over. Um, and we recommend putting your sign up in your window. Yes. So we are super thankful to have David and Ellen from Extinction Rebellion Chicago in the house tonight. I'll let them tell you a bit more about their work, uh, but we invited Ex Extinction Rebellion or XR to join us for this workshop because they teach a nonviolent direct action workshop and have led some successfully disruptive actions that provide an opportunity for dialogue and at best actual material change. XR is a group dedicated to climate justice. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Ellen from uh, Extinction Rebellion Chicago. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm a teacher and a beekeeper in Chicago and I've been working with Extinction Rebellion since January uh, 2019, mostly working on nonviolent direct action training. Um, so much of what you hear tonight will be, a lot of it will be material from our uh, NVDA trainings. David? I'm, yeah, my name's David. I use he, him pronouns with Extinction Rebellion Chicago. I've been involved in a wide range of protest movements for many years, um, also electoral politics, and now very involved with Extinction Rebellion, working on nonviolent direct action for climate justice, and I live here in Chicago as well. Super excited to be here um, and very appreciative that all of you are taking the time to have this important conversation. So thanks for being here. Next slide. So um, I really appreciated what Gwyneth and Latham said at the beginning that we're not experts and you know all the uh, 
theory that we're going to be talking about, about nonviolent direct action tonight really rests on years and years of action, you know, over generations of time. Um, and we're just talking really about our own practical experience and what little we know about that, um, but are happy to share it with you all. So we're going to talk at a high level about some principles, try to reflect on how they relate to what's happening today. Um, and then some simple things based mostly on our own practical experience around strategies and tactics. Um, we'll move pretty quickly through the slides. Um, feel free to um, post questions in the chat, but we're gonna pause and have some discussion at the end where we'll, we'll talk. So that'll be the time to have uh, conversation. Um, and uh, so we're gonna try to take this part of the conversation to nine o'clock and then we'll move into the super exciting art making. Next slide. Okay, so Extinction Rebellion Chicago, just quickly, um, we are a nonviolent direct action rebellion happening in over 65 countries around the world to uh, address the climate crisis. It started in the UK with um, a series of pretty dramatic uh, direct actions in which central London was shut down and uh, the UK Parliament as a result of the crisis that resulted declared a climate emergency. And there are chapters all over the world and Ellen and I work with the Chicago chapter. Next slide. Uh, we have four demands. The first is that we feel that we should talk about climate justice, uh, the climate crisis for what it is, um, a likely extinction event. We believe that we should be getting to net zero emissions uh, in the United States and globally by 2025. Next slide. Um, we believe strongly in direct democracy and participatory democracy as a way to guide that, tra um, that transition to net zero emissions. And then importantly, our fourth um, demand is what we call a just tr transition. I'm just gonna pause for a second and read it. We demand a just transition that prioritizes the most vulnerable people and indigenous sovereignty, establishes reparations and remediation led by and for black people, indigenous people, people of color, and poor communities for the years of environmental injustice they've uh, been subject to, establishes legal rights for ecosystems to thrive and regenerate in perpetuity and repairs the effects of ongoing ecocide to prevent extinction of human and all species in order to maintain a livable and just planet for all. This is central to who we are as a movement here in the United States, that fourth demand. It's not actually a feature of the platforms necessarily in other countries, but it's central to what we're doing here in the United States because we believe climate justice is racial justice. Um, the form of extractive capitalism that is destroying the planet um, has been at the same time it has been uh, oppressing the planet and natural resources it has been oppressing uh, and extracting value um, from people. Uh, and more often than not, communities of color on the front lines of that fight. Um, this is, for those of you living in Chicago on the right here, these are pictures of Little Village, which is a Latinx community here in Chicago um, that shut down a coal plant uh, after years and years and years of fighting. And then um, they're currently demolishing that coal plant and they demolished it on Easter Sunday, sending a toxic cloud of dust through the entire neighborhood during a pul pulmonary pandemic. Um, so, that's where the fight is. The fight is in communities of color and alongside communities of color. So um, it's also really important for us as we think about uh, raising the alarm about a possible extinction event um, that we center the needs of uh, communities of color. Otherwise, we run the risk of what's sometimes called eco-fascism. Uh, people believing that the problem, that climate change is caused by overpopulation of 
communities of color, et cetera. Uh, so it's really important, especially as white people, raising the alarm that we make sure we're watching out um, for communities of color. And a lot of urgency around the climate change right now, um, but there's been tons of work for years trying to get the environmental movement to think about environmental justice. And just because it's even more urgent now, we don't want to throw that work out. So um, that's just a little bit to describe why we think these two issues are wholly intersectional. Next slide. All right. So let's talk a little bit about what nonviolent direct action is. Um, the, this is one of these great Chi activist things, uh, actions in Seattle, keeping a uh, shell oil rig from heading out of the harbor in Seattle and going to uh, drill in the Arctic Sea. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront whatever issue you're working on. It seeks so to dr dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. Uh, Dr. King, actually stay there. Um, yeah. Dr. King, um, letter from Birmingham jail. If you haven't turned your attention to that piece of writing, it's uh, really amazing. I read it, tr try to read it frequently. Um, I think this is a really important um, question. I'm just going to talk really specifically to my own personal experience with this issue. As somebody who worked in the movements against the second Iraq war, um, and just before that war started, there was what was claimed to be the largest single day of protest in the history of the world, in which people all over the world came out into the streets, uh, demanding that you know the coalition not go to war in Iraq, and uh, the Bush administration, Bush himself, dismissed it as a kind of like governing by focus group, and then started the war, which. You know, um, it, that protest did not actually have any impact on the Bush administration, didn't create a crisis. Years later, I saw the Standing Rock um, action where people were putting their bodies in front of um, fossil fuel cap fossil fueled capitalism and creating a substantive crisis for energy transfer partners, for the Obama administration, for others, to actually stop that pipeline from going through indigenous lands. Um, and it really reactivated my sense of what was possible and what we're trying to do and what's necessary in terms of uh, building the, the just world that I think we all would like to live in. So this question, next slide, um, about whether or not we're creating um, a crisis and what happens with that crisis. It's clear to me personally, I think, um, you know, we'll, we can discuss this a little bit later, that the current uprising has created a crisis for those in power. Um, the question, of course, will be what happens as a result of that crisis? Does substantive change for Black Lives really happen? Uh, where does it happen? Um, will that crisis, does it need to be sustained? Um, will it be reignited again and again, et cetera? So that's our question. How do we create a crisis for those in power? Next slide. Protest really, especially your classic sort of sanctioned uh, protest march um, is about demanding something of people in power it can be a very powerful and useful thing for us in the movement. Uh, whatever movement we're talking about, it's a great way to come together, to get energized, um, to, um, to uh, radicalize or activate people who hadn't been activated before, and to send a message about our numbers and support for a particular issue. 
but it is different than direct action where we're looking to actually reach out and affect the levers of power. So when the, um, you know, just this week, um, the students at the University of Chicago occupied the security services um, on campus, that's direct action. Um, when um, uh, the police station in Minneapolis was occupied, I think three or four years ago, that's direct action. Um, what are ways that we can actually get out and actually try to affect people in power and create that crisis? Some examples, next slide. Nonviolence starts by assuming, it doesn't ask for additional rights. It starts by assuming that you have those rights and then claims them through acting. Um, so this is our land, said the people in Standing Rock. We do not give you license to bring this pipeline through our land. Um, we're going to put our bodies in the way of, of this land, of, of the pipeline project, because this is our land. Uh, this is Extinction Rebellion in London, um, taking central London surrounding the parliament and, and just taking the space, locking themselves to this pink boat um, and not moving for eight days. So you're moving in, you're claiming space. If you're not being directed by the police about where to go or when to go or when to stop or when to start, you take the space and claim it um, and then work backwards from that um, assertion of rights. Next slide. And the thing that happens when you do that is that the injustice you're fighting often is revealed to be what it is um by virtue of its response to to the movement claiming that space or claiming those rights and this has so happened in the last two weeks um the militarized um aggressively violent unprovoked obscene response to the protests over the last two weeks has revealed the um I mean, I, as an activist in Chicago, had no idea that we spend $1.7 billion on the Chicago PD every year. Um, and you see, I mean, I'd seen it before, but there's something about this sort of militarized response that reveals it for what it is, right? The classic example on the left of we, you know, sitting in at the lunch counter and, and revealing the ugliness of Jim Crow in, um, in, you know, 1950s Southern states simply by taking this action and then it reveals itself. Um, next slide. And it, what we do is we reach out and we actually try to have a direct impact toward the, the trajectory we're seeking. This was something um, that happened, uh, I believe in Atlanta last week. So huge march, huge protest. Um, uh, a black woman was arrested by the police and the crowd just surrounded the police car. And didn't let the police car move. Uh, they didn't attack the car. They didn't, but they very clearly by virtue of their numbers showed that they were more powerful than the police and the police released uh, this woman um, un unhandcuffed her and, and released her back um, to her friends. Um, so that is, you know, directly going to the, um, you know, affecting that dynamic and that power relationship. Happened to me the other day at 53rd and King Drive. Um, I was at a protest um, and a young black man was stopped for a traffic violation and surrounded by four cop cars um, who were there watching our protest. And a group, I didn't do this work. Like I came across it like a group of young black women maybe about 10 of them were just standing there witnessing that action. 
and watching what the cops were going to do, um, looking for ways to de-escalate it. Uh, and we all just stood and watched until um, he was released. Um, so, so that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to reach out and actually affect change, not just ask for uh, that change. Next slide. And I mean, I think, you know, what we're trying to do is manifest the world. I think the classic simplest example of this is, is critical mass. <laughs> if anybody's been on a critical mass ride, like we imagine a world that has no cars in it and is all bicycles. So we're just gonna do that every Friday afternoon without asking the police for, for um, permission to do it. Um, but this Louisville protest, um, I think is a great example. We believe that, that white people should stand up for black lives. So we're gonna do that. We believe that this, you know, senior woman in Hong Kong should have the agency to make her own decisions and do what she wants to do. So she's just gonna do it. Um, so you make, you, you make the world you hope to live in manifest directly um, rather than just slowly working towards it. Uh, and that's the difference between protesting and, um, or one difference between protesting and non, uh, nonviolent direct action. Next slide. Is that Seoul? I thought it was Hong Kong. Thank you. Um, um, so I think it, there's a real interest in, you know, I want to just call out that there isn't necessarily um, that the lines between these two things are blurred, right? Like um, at that action where the woman was released from the police uh, cruiser. Uh, I'm sure that wasn't necessarily the intent of that march that day, but the people, the, the, the protesting bodies just went and took, took and claimed that space um, and, and made that happen. Or the, um, uh, as I understand it, uh, four years ago when the uh, Minneapolis police um, district building was occupied. That wasn't intended. It was just a protest that happened. And then people moved into the police building and stayed there for two weeks. Right. So the line between, um, and you know, a lot of the, you know, what happened in Puerto Rico um, a couple of years ago when the governor stepped down just by virtue of the fact that people came out and protested and weren't going to leave. Um, so the line between protest and direct action can blur. Um, it's not, not hard and fast. And I, and I also just want to, you know, you know, not call out that protest is bad or some, you know, that there's some kind of hierarchy here. Um, it's important that, um, they all play different roles in our efforts to, to get justice. So now we're going to talk a little bit about, um, just some some techniques and um or first some sorry first some sort of basic principles and strategy around why not theory around why nonviolent direct action works um there's a lot of writing on this i am certainly not a expert on it um extinction rebellion in particular owes a lot of our thinking to and work to a scholar by the name of Erica Chenoweth, who has done taken um, data from movements for change and regime change in uh, across the world from 1900 to 2006, and looked at um, where they had when they actually achieved whatever they wanted to achieve, regime change or some law being changed. Um, and the difference between violent and nonviolent actions. Uh, she found that nonviolent movements for change were three times more likely to achieve whatever their goals were. Um, and that that was true when um, not everybody, not the whole population got into the streets, but when approximately three and a half percent of the population was out in the streets engaged in 
nonviolent direct action. Um, and one of the things that's really important about that is nonviolence, if you need that kind of numbers, which in the United States is about 11 million people, um, you want to reduce the barriers to entry for people to come into the streets. Um, typically, uh, you know, young men often are attracted to violence or are attracted to guerrilla warfare in the instances of these studies and are willing to live in a, in the jungle in a cave, but most people aren't. Nonviolence invites the kind of participation that'll get you the numbers you need. And when you get those kind of numbers, um, sorry if there's noise in the background, um, when you get those kind of numbers, what begins to happen is the pillars of support that support whatever regime you're talking about, the business community, the civil servants, et cetera, begin to withdraw their support um, because the nonviolent protesters are sympathetic. Um, and you see this, right? You saw, I don't know if you saw the instance of the Oklahoma sheriff who turned in his badge uh, during a BLM protest last week and join the protesters or the um, bus drivers that refused to, to take protesters to jail. Um, some small instances of this exact kind of theory happening during these protests. Um, I'm going to post a link at the end of this to look into Erica Chenoweth. Her writing is really interesting and um, you can find out uh, more about it later. Next slide. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about just some specific tactics. You're going to a protest. Uh, maybe it's this weekend. Um, how, you know, not so much like planning a direct action, which takes more work, but just like how do we as white people show up in these protests in a way that's skillful um, and ideally nonviolent? Um, so... The first thing is to just show up and, and think about your role as being useful. Um, not going just to express your rage or your anger or your opinion, but how can you show up at that action in a way that you're gonna just look for ways to be useful? Um, really important, this is something that I, um, we talk about a lot, Ellen and I, in our training, uh, remembering who your target is. Uh, so we're often targeting the government or targeting Chase Bank, but the people who are affected most directly by our actions are the security guards, are, um, you know, the, the motorists who we're, when we're blocking an intersection. They actually aren't our target, right? Um, and it's important to keep your eye on that target. That's very complicated in the current situation. I often say, you know, the police aren't our target, um, but that's not the case in this current situation. But I think it's just important to remember. Um, and there can be a lot of energy in an action when somebody says, get a job, you hippie or whatever, to like turn your attention to that person and want to go after them. Um, but you know, you're never gonna have a, a shouting argument at a protest and actually convince somebody to no longer be racist. Um, so remember your target. Second thing, it's really important, sorry, stay, stay on the past slide, um, to just ground yourself. Um, I've really experienced this in the last couple weeks. The uh, adrenaline that comes, that moves into your body, um, the, the feeling of wanting to lean into in a kind of aggressive way. And it's really important to find ways to just um, have a kind of noble posture, as I think of it, that's the term I use, where I have a strong back and a soft front, um, but I'm not, I'm not aggressively leaning into the work. So breathing, taking time. And I'd like to actually ask everybody to just do that for a second. 
Um, just we're talking about things that are sort of intense. So just take a quick moment, drop your shoulders, close your eyes if you want, and take a deep breath. Now open your eyes and look over your left shoulder in a way that actually engages your hips. So you're twisting enough that your hips are engaged. And look over your right shoulder. And come back to center. So this is uh, a little practice that I got from uh, Resma Menachem, um, who does these courses on racist or, or racialized trauma. Um, and he talks a lot about how our animal body, like we're having a conversation in this room, but our animal body is often thinking something like, yeah, but what else is about to happen? <laughs> like, where's the danger? And if you actually engage your psoas, that muscle in your, in your abdomen, um, it, it tells your body that actually you're cool. There's nobody behind you. You're fine. So looking for ways to really relax. Next slide. This is uh, Portland last week. People lying down on a bridge in Portland claiming that space. In Extinction Rebellion, we have a team that's red. Uh, we call the red team who are usually are locking on to an object, risking arrest, blocking the doors, not moving when the cops ask them to move. But you do not have a red team unless you have the yellow team, which is the buffering team that gives them time to come in and take that space. We sometimes use critical mass for that, which is awesome. They're like mobile, they can really take space, we can move in. Um, and then the green team is just, you know, bringing them water or supporting them in some other way. But uh, it's easy to kind of like highlight the red team as the people who are really doing the work. But if you don't have that kind of space, um, you, can't, uh, you can't do that direct action. Sitting is a really powerful way to, to tell a different, tell the story of nonviolence. If I'm standing, you know, I'm leaning forwards, police line, protest line, we're, you know, in conflict with one another. Sitting, lying down like these guys are doing, take space, claim space, but also signals like, A, we're not leaving, B, this is our place, this is our street, and C, we're not interested in violence. Um, singing, there's a lot less singing than you know, and traditional nonviolent protest movements, but it's a powerful way um, to sort of bring a different energy than chanting. Um, and if you're in a situation where uh, when we do our nonviolent direct action trainings, um, it's if I have one person or two people in an intersection standing in front of a car, that car really feels like it could easily move forward. But if I have a line of people that's two or three people deep, um, pedestrians, cars, et cetera, are not gonna try to push through that. Um, and the one-to-one -one relationship uh, exacerbates conflict, whereas the many-to-one to or many-to-many -many tends to de-escalate. Um, so, so numbers are really powerful and really important. Um, next slide. Hey David. Yeah. I'm just I'm gonna flag that it is 850. I think we I could see that. <laughs> uh, but I think we could um, you know do this uh, maybe go into Ellen section after this and then we can just do a, like a 15 minute Q and A. Yeah, uh, I apologize. Does that sound good? Yeah, it does. Cool. Carry on. <laughs> yeah, just want to quickly say one thing that's really interesting about uh, de-escalation is looking for ways to give people space to save face and move through something. Like, is our idea that we're what we're actually doing here is holding this intersection so nobody can get through? 
And is our focus the, the cars um, or is it something else? So I was at an action recently with Lavejo. We took an intersection with a relatively small number of people and a semi-truck driver got out of, the, out of the semi-truck and started throwing punches at the protesters. Um, and I stepped up to a young man who was shouting at him and said, uh, this is not, this guy is not our problem. The mayor is our problem. And that gave him an opportunity to be like, right, I don't need to fight this guy. And he kind of stepped back. And then uh, the truck driver got back into his truck and I said to him, could you just like take a left here and do a U-turn and get back on the highway <laughs> and gave him a way to be like, yeah, I don't actually have to plow through this, this intersection. I can find a way to get through it. So just looking for ways to give people an opportunity to release the tension that gets built up by direct action. Next slide. Um, Cool. So what do you think, Latham? Should we, should we have some conversation now or should we go directly into Ellen's slides? Um, up to y'all. I think we should get, we should, we just should just get to Anders section no later than 915. So however you yeah. all want to do that, I'm, I'm down for. I'll point yeah, out that, that so far there, there have been two questions posted in the chat. Just okay. So maybe let's um, do those questions and then and then we'll um, and then we'll move on. Go to Ellen. Yes. Cool. Okay, great. So um, Robin asked, and by all means, Robin, feel free to um, pipe up if you want to. Is the three times statistic uh, nonviolent direct action versus violent direction direct action and or nonviolent slash violent protesting? If that question makes sense, I, it, referring to the um, the statistic you posted much earlier. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't actually understand the question. What's I the question, I just posted Robin? in the chat. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I can clarify. I was just curious if the three times more likely to achieve movement goals is uh, nonviolent direct action um, versus violent direct action or versus protesting of uh, uh, differently from direct action, whether violent or nonviolent. Yes, that is a, um, a very good question. Um, as I understand her research, it means uh, the difference between armed, often armed struggle, violent dir direct action, and nonviolent direct action. So she would, I think, say that the sort of nonviolent protesting is, um, is part of nonviolent direct action, if I'm, if I'm understanding your question correctly. Cool. Uh, she also has done some really interesting thinking about the relationship between um, uh, primarily nonviolent direct action movements and what she calls violent flanks, which are often part of of nonviolent movements, right? There's some group, a smaller group of people, a contingency that's engaged in more destructive or directly violent um, work and how the, that affects the dynamics. Cool, thank you. Um, I'm also posting in the chat what Jeremy asked, um, who should we point out undercover cops to when we see them? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think, uh, you know, whoever's in charge, the, you know, usually, ideally, there's a, there's marshals or legal observers, um, NLG, the National Lawyers Guild often has lime green hats, they would be a good person to point them out to. Um, I also but, would add that in this instance, you know, this is maybe where like a smartphone and social media can be helpful is that if, um, if you're certain, <laughs> then, then you should be able to maybe like, if you can capture a photo, if not, you can kind of go to, if there's a, like if the protest is listed on social media or the action is listed on social media, um, then you can sort of maybe put an alert in there. Um, I think if, 
that's only if you don't have the options that David sort of laid out. But I think there are some other ways to sort of at least try to get a message to start circulating to who needs to see it. I also think it's helpful to just go up and talk to people. I was at a protest recently where there was a bunch of white dudes in like vaguely military gear, like hanging out in the background, like watching. And I was just like, hello, my name's David. What's your name? <laughs> and just like checked them out. And, you know, they talked to me for a while and then they left. Right. So that goes to the point of being useful, right? Like just, Involve yourself, don't take over the protest, but just look for ways to be useful um, and, uh, and paying attention to, to what, what's happening on the ground, what's happening around you, so that you can keep other people safe. Any other questions or comments? That, I think that's it. Um, okay. So far, but people, please, everybody feel free to keep asking questions in the chat. Great. Um, I'm going to post, uh, we have a, a resource that we've been putting together for our own folks based on theories, thoughts on intersectionality between climate and racial justice, whole variety of different practices. The blog Waging Nonviolence, the website Waging Nonviolence is an excellent one, which has a lot of really cool, timely content on it, like right now about what's happening. Um, this is Resma Menachem, who I was talking about, and then all of these books um, are excellent resources for thinking about nonviolent direct action. Um, and these, are, these aren't yet in our resource toolkit, but we'll add them shortly. And I'll post them to the chat right now. Go ahead, Ellen. You're muted. Yeah, can you unmute yourself, Neil? So um, we are in the middle of our June um, NVDA online training. Um, it will wrap up this the, the end of this week. Um, and we would like to invite you, if you're interested in it, to um, participate in our July training, which begins on July 11th. Um, our trainings are online. They're, they, they include uh, four uh, synchronous meetings on Saturdays, one to three, and then small group discussions in between. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the, the recent sort of history of our trainings because the, that history has, has forced us to think about the nature of NVDA. So we, because of just in the moment contingencies of what was going on, we've had to think really carefully about what we mean by nonviolent direct action and, and its role. So, um, and that, that link will be in the chat too. Uh, next slide. So this is where we were last fall. We were shoulder to shoulder, arms linked, yelling pretty much in each other's faces. Um, you know, this was real, you know, street action. Um, but as of March, and this is what our trainings had been preparing people to do. So we did um, uh, de-escalation exercises, um, we uh, hassle line exercises, we did um, practice blockades, thinking about what does it feel like if you're a single line, what does, it people, what does it feel like if it's a double line, people sitting down, just kind of going through all of those really physical activities. Um, we were doing that up until March, and then we had to uh, figure out how to do something different. Partly because we simply couldn't do face-to-face -face trainings, but also because we had to find ways to continue doing direct action under conditions of lockdown. So um, we developed the online training in response to that. So uh, next slide. Um, to try to figure out what could people still do. And we came up with six different categories of, of actions that people could do that would observe social distancing. And the reason for this was because a number of reasons. One was simply that social distancing is not simply a, met, uh, a means of protecting yourself, it's a means of protecting others. It's the, it's the ethical thing to do. Um, also because um, the prospect of going to jail is very different under these kinds of conditions than it had been before. I mean, uh, we had had many actions in which we put ourselves into arrestable positions, but we knew that that was not a, a wise thing to do under these conditions. And then finally, the, we had to really think carefully about the question of 
what does it mean to do disruptive actions when everything is disrupted, when everyone feels that every aspect of their life is disrupted, and we, we would be simply adding to that disruption. So that just caused us to think about a lot of different things. So um, next slide. Uh, we came up with six categories of actions, and I'm gonna talk about just the four of them that had the most resonance for um, what happened the, the following month, and uh, resonance for questions of intersectionality and solidarity. So um, we did, we, we uh, um, so the, the trainings are organized around affinity groups. So people join the trainings, we put them into small groups. And then during the course of the four week training, those affinity groups brainstorm, plan, carry out, and then evaluate an action, you know, during the course of, of the training. At least that's been the goal. And it's, it's changed a little bit in the last few weeks. But so one category is just uh, social media messaging actions, which obviously, you know, can be done under uh, conditions of, of lockdown. Uh, we try to give people really specific ideas about how they can do these actions as, as in addition to just kind of general examples. Uh, so next slide. So for example, um, the uh, um, uh, San Francisco uh, Bay Area a chapter of Extinction Rebellion offers these online regenerative act activism sessions every other Friday at, at noontime, Pacific time, so that people could just actually do an action right there, you know, in their lunch hour. Um, and they're still doing these every other week. And they're, they're, try they're as far as I can see, um, really trying to focus on solidarity, you know, actions that are in support of the uh, Black Lives Movement. Um, so you can get information about that, and it's a really nice way to just kind of get involved in some sort of immediate, mostly social media kinds of actions. Uh, next slide. Hey, Ellen, are we on a, uh, is it this Friday or next Friday that the rotation? That is a really good question, and I meant to check. <laughs> I will check that, and we'll put it in the, yeah, thanks. Um, our other two, two of our other categories are uh, real world messaging, things that take place in the real world, either in a single location where there's a particular target or a particular, um, in this case, iconic piece of statuary that can be used as part of the action. Um, and then very similar to this, and uh, next slide, are what we call multi-local real world actions, which also take place in the real world, but it doesn't really matter so much where they are. So it could be, in, in, in this case, it, it took place in at least three or four different states. Uh, these were actions focusing on uh, grocery stores and on the connection between COVID and uh, climate change. So it's focusing on things like food deserts, food insecurity, um, food pipelines, and things like that. Um, and so those, the categories of real world messaging, uh, uh, multi-local, local, and then social media messaging, even though those were separate categories, they, they overlap in a lot of ways. Because even if you're doing an action that's in the real world, you need to amplify it with social media. So there's a lot of overlap among these different things. So in our um, April and May, our, our uh, April May act, uh, training, a lot of the emphasis was on the connection between um, the pandemic and climate change. In our June action, even though we were still sort of thinking of those things, um, the, 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 the uprising had begun, the protests had begun, Black Lives Matter protests had, had started. And so people were really thinking more about that. So we had to kind of pivot again. Um, and the, the April, May actions were sort of based, the April, May training was based on the idea that we may be in these kind of lockdown conditions for many months to come and we have to sort of get used to those kinds of actions. Um, when the Black Lives Matter protest started, we realized that people are going to be in the streets. And so we needed to sort of shift our, our, our emphasis again. So next slide. So we're in the middle of our June actions and we have, um, I think, five different affinity groups that are working on plans for different kinds of actions. And so these are just some of the things that um, our, our participants have been doing just designing these wonderful kinds of signage things, which this is designed to be a lawn so, uh, sign, but it could also be put online, it could be put on a poster. So they've just been sharing these beautiful designs that focus on the question of the intersections between climate and racial justice and on the question of solidarity. You know, how do people from an environmental organization show their solidarity with this protest, which is focusing on something else, but it's something that is connected to what we do. So next slide, this is just uh, the, uh, another version of, um, of the kinds of designs that people have been making. 
Um, next slide. And so we're also thinking about, you know, how to show up at a protest, how to um, have a message that is in support of uh, a protest that has a different kind of focus. So another thing that we had to do at, in the course of the training was realizing that, so our, our, our June training started at the very end of May. And um, every Saturday since then, there has been some sort of action going on. And so we off, every Saturday, we have to sort of make the decision, are we gonna have our, our session today? Are we gonna recognize that people are going to protest? And kind of the decision that we came to was that because we, were, we had participants from so many different time zones, we should keep the training session as it was, but invite people to, you know, go to the protest, send us pictures, talk about what they were doing. And so a great deal of the discussion has turned around, um, here's something that I did. So this is one of our participants, Brett, I think he might be here tonight, um, showing up at an action in solidarity um, and also just kind of having a presence of um, Extinction Rebellion. So next slide. Uh, here's the same sign, this beautiful design, um, just, you know, in a different place in the action. And uh, next slide. Um, this is something that we, we try, we make available to our uh, trainees. Um, this is a, a toolkit that was put together by Extinction Rebellion New York that is, it gives you all of the material and sort of instructions that you need in order to have a local action that can be coordinated and then amplified nationally or internationally. And so what they, the, the, the toolkit involves um, making a banner that you might just hold up in some possibly geographically recognizable space in your city, your town, um, with a message. And it, and it can be any message, but the idea is to coordinate these messages so that they can be amplified on social media. So this is a really nice toolkit that, and that's something else that we can put into our resources. Uh, next slide. So the final category of action is a little bit different. This is vehicle actions. Um, and this, there's quite a bit of controversy about vehicle actions involving cars within the environmental movement. Um, but the argument for this particular action, which took place in Little Village, uh, it was in um, collaboration with, the, uh, with El Vejo, the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, targeting, I think David was talking about this, targeting this coal plant that was in process of being demolished. And many people in Extinction Rebellion did not want to participate in an action involving um, CO2 emissions. But the argument that was made here was that that's kind of the point of the action. It's, it's bringing the pollution that we experience in our neighborhood into the downtown and just sort of making that point. So um, that was an example of an action in which you know, our decisions were very much kind of following along with what the group that we were in collaboration with was doing. Um, so vehicle actions can be um, very powerful and they're one really good way of being able to target physical locations under conditions of pandemic. Um, the, but there are other kinds of vehicle actions. So uh, next slide. Uh, David showed that wonderful picture of kayaktivism in which people in kayaks actually blocked the movement of um, an oil tanker, um, which is dangerous, but it has been effective, at least in for short periods of time. Um, but bike actions can also be really powerful. As David mentioned, um, a number of our actions have involved um, critical mass people on bicycles helping to you know, block an intersection. Um, and there's an action taking place on Saturday, 4 p.m. They're gonna meet at Jane Adams, and it's uh, writing in solidarity to, to uh, support CPAC. Um, which is this, uh, David, maybe you can give a little bit more. This is about the defunding of the defunding of the Chicago Police Department. So it's got Black Riot Lives, Black Rides for Black Lives. And I think we have information about that there. So next slide. Um, the final point that I wanna make about this is that moving our, our training online entailed many losses. We couldn't have that physical embodied activity that we had before. But um, it also kind of unexpectedly opened things up for us quite a bit. Um, an online space is a little bit more welcoming, a little bit more neutral. It's a little bit easier to participate in an online space uh, than a physical space that you might not feel quite so comfortable entering. And so it's given us opportunities for more collaboration, for more sharing, um, and for just opening up the trainings to you know, as, as many people um, from any kind, any geographical area um, that 
you know, could participate in the training. So um, I think that's all that I have on this. So yeah, um, we would love to have you participate in one of our trainings and happy to answer any questions about it. So um, thank you. Audrey had a question and it's, it's in the chat, um, but I can uh, read it aloud. And Audrey, if you want to unmute and speak as well. Hi. Uh, sorry, this is more kind of along the lines of like, what a meaningful direct action is, mm -hmm. kind of like a spur of the moment direct action, uh, which has to do with a protest that I went to yesterday, um, in which at the end of the protest, after the organizers had left, uh, they had sort of just dispersed and most of the people had dispersed, but the reason for us being there was to get uh, an older woman to recognize that we were there so um, some of the protesters, there were about three or four who were all white protesters laid down in the street. And it created a lot of tension. There were about 57 cops that I counted. And they started surrounding everyone like bystanders. I sort of stayed just to record and observe. But I was sort of, and it definitely created drama. Like it wasn't it created a tension, like locals stopped and they like looked out of their windows and they like stopped on the street and started watching what was going on because of the way that, uh, you know, the, the officers were reacting. But I was sort of nervous about participating because I wasn't sure if it was coming from like the best intentions. Um, but at the end of the day, it sort of, it did have some kind of effect, but maybe not exactly what they were looking for, what we were looking for is to make a statement. So I was just sort of wanting to like hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. I, I'll just quickly take that Ellen and then I'd love to hear your thoughts. But I think one thing that's an interesting question is the sort of dynamic between planned actions and unplanned actions. <laughs> and um, you know, when Extinction Rebellion, when we do our like significant actions, we do a lot of planning, we scout, we make sure we have numbers, we have assignments, red, yellow, green team, you know, we understand what our objectives are, we talk through scenarios, what if the cops do this, what if the cops don't do this. Um, and that I think is helpful in that it, 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 it creates a kind of discipline and a focus and ideally, you know, more effect. Um, but then also what happens is, you know, people just do stuff because they're angry or they're whatever. And then that I think comes to the question of like just being a presence of nonviolence and a presence of de-escalation and a presence of witnessing so that you can, you know, we had a, we had a protest just sort of get taken over by a bunch of kids one time and most people left and they were just, we were just kind of running through the streets of downtown with the cops following us. And eventually I was just like, look guys, we gotta go. <laughs> this is not do, you know, when do you step in, you know, cause the, you know, and that's, I think when the cops, A, there's less people around to watch the cops. Um, and B, if you're, you know, if you don't have people who, who are bringing an idea of nonviolence, it can get escalated and violent, you know, unintended violence can happen. So. Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. Um, luckily, no one was like injured, just some yeah, sh like people shoved. One. And that and... weird moment at the end of a protest where it's like, what's up? Like, not everybody wants to go home. That's a pretty fraught moment. I'll just add something really quickly, which is that um, you may make mistakes, you know, I mean, in, in the moment, we, we've, we've had actions in which some very important part of the action didn't show up, and then we had to figure out what we were going to do. Um, and you may make a mistake. I think that if you come to it with the principles that we've been talking about tonight, that it's, it may not necessarily be your action, you're there for support, um, you're going to try to de-escalate and keep things nonviolent. But I think you still, you do have to recognize that sometimes there, something will go wrong and you may make a mistake. But I think if you're acting out of a 
a place of, of solidarity and support that, you know, it will be seen for what it, for what it is. Thank cool. you so much. Thank you for the question. Um, and I, I'll just say that also Courtney um, asked uh, or said something that I'm appreciating is the imagery of ranging tactics and direct action. Does anyone suggest specific readings, authors who work on something like the aesthetics of direct action? And I, I think maybe Ellen and David, if you can forward us um, uh, authors and readings that you recommend and we'll post them in our um, resource toolkit for you all. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things we're recording is the chat. So, I mean, we will be able to kind of, um, when we have time, um, you know, condense these into like a list and share them with folks. So in the resource toolkit as well. So um, I just, I, oh, sorry. I just posted in the chat, um, Chicago actions this week. Um, so feel free to open that doc and see what is happening. Yeah, um, so, you know, big um, thanks to uh, David and Ellen for um, sharing their deep knowledge with us tonight. Um, and hopefully we'll just keep the conversation going into the future. Um, but it is time for us to switch gears at the moment. Um, so um, want to um, turn to artist and printmaker Anders Zanikowski um, for a crash course workshop on protest sign making. Um, or direct action sign making. I, I sort of always thought of them as the same and I feel like I'm, I'm learning a lot um, in this session that they're not the same. Um, but this session will include some optional unstructured time and maybe even a show and tell at the end. Um, and we will um, formally close out the session probably right at the end of uh, Anders's slideshow. Um, and then if folks want to stay and like work collaboratively as a group and then like, you know, get feedback or spitball ideas or whatever, um, that's what that's for. Um, so, uh, Anders, you want to take it from here? Hi, yeah, thank you, Latham and Gwyneth and um, David and Ellen um, and M uh, NYU and Acre for hosting um, and everybody who's here. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Anders, I'm an artist, I'm an activist. Um, recently I taught a workshop uh, through my job at Spudnik Press Cooperative in Chicago um, on uh, DIY protest art. Um, so I guess I'll say a little bit about my background. Um, I've been an artist for about 20 years and I've also been an activist for about 15 years. Um, and um, I am really, I really think a lot about um, how we say things, not just what we say. Um, and I also really believe that everybody actually is an artist um, and there's a lot that um, activist movements can learn from art. Um, and Kenyon Farrow, who is a longtime uh, housing and racial justice and HIV AIDS activist, um, Kenyon Farrow has talked about how his background as a performer uh, in theater was why he made such a good protester. Um, and so I think it's really important for us to like think about the ways that we can use art. Um, so I'm going to start um, with um, thinking about uh, thinking about protest art, um, especially in the time of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, some of our protest art is a sign that we carry to an action. Some of it is a banner that we drop with our friends from uh, a, a, like a an overpass, um, and some of the protest art might actually be digital graphics that you use on social media, uh, that you use in your email signature, that you use, you know, in, in, in creative, clever ways, and some of it might also be mail art. So we'll talk about a, a couple different options for folks. Um, and if we can start um, on the next slide, um, I just want to uh, put some visuals in front of us right away of art that is uh, lifting up memorials, beautiful, beautiful, and um, honoring memorials of Black people who have been murdered by police. Um, so these are by an artist, Shireen. Um, there is their Instagram, if you want to see. These have been making the rounds um, because they, they have a really uh, incredible impact uh, visually. And one thing for us as white folks to remember when we think about the visuals that we're using um, in any kind of protest art is um, to really respect the call from Black activists and Black people 
to not flood people's news feeds and timelines and media with images of violence against black people. Um, and that can be really challenging for us when we're trying to um, make demands and organize on behalf of black people who have been violently murdered. Um, and so these images, and then if we wanna go to the next slide, um, other images that were created by an artist in solidarity are ways of honoring those victims without re-traumatizing black people with more scenes of black death. Um, and so I think that that's really important. If we are gonna watch those videos that we do it privately or with each other, but not flood people's feeds. Um, and to also not duplicate um, violent uh, messaging in our own rhetoric, but more like what David um, and Ellen were talking about, like using our art to create the world we want to live in and imagine that world is there. Um, and then um, work from a, 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 a like a, a calling in of that vision. Um, so, so this is an example of something that you might do if you really love drawing and you want to pull up a photograph of someone who has been a victim and find a graduation photo or a birthday photo or just a, a picture of them that's circulating, a selfie, you know, some picture they actually took of themselves that they liked, um, and then to use any of this kind of imagery to create um, something to honor them. Uh, that can be a great digital graphic. Um, and then if we can go to the next slide, um, we'll talk through some of the language that we might use. So um, situations where, uh, you know, there's a lot of different protest so uh, slogans going around, chants going around, and there are things that, um, that I personally feel, and, and this is in response to a lot of uh, calls from Black leaders, um, things that white folks should probably take a sideline on, um, and then other language that we abso absolutely should be lifting up. Um, so um, I wanted to get us thinking in case you're not totally sure what language you might want to use for whatever you want to make tonight, um, especially if you have maybe haven't been out in the streets. These are some of the chants, the call and response, the protest signs that have been going around. Um, White silence equals white violence is a really, really common one. Um, and, and then also the example here of groups of people who are non, not Black identifying ourselves based on some other aspect of our identity um, and saying that we are standing for Black lives. Um, so really highlighting that as our presence, like white queers for Black lives, white Jews for Black lives. Um, for example. Um, so if we want to go to the, maybe to the next slide, um, these are some ideas of, of things that, that folks can make. Um, it could be uh, something physical, so like a poster that you hang in your window, uh, put on your car. Uh, hey, if your job is cool, you could put it up at your job. Um, something that you could take to protest, or if you're not going uh, to, uh, to protest, um, you could give it to someone who is. That's a really great way to support the movements uh, in the streets. Um, other ideas um, are, are things like armbands, um, which have always been used as memorials and as political statements. I, am, I would love to see the resurgence of the armband um, personally, so maybe I'll try to make some of those. I don't, I'm not too great with fabric, but um, it's an armband, so it should be pretty simple. And then of course we're all wearing masks, um, and so uh, decorating a mask, putting a slogan on a mask, or, or having something you could pin to the surface of your mask as an extra piece of fabric um, that has a slogan on it. Um, and the, in that case, it is visually speaking for you when your mouth is covered, which is pretty powerful. Um, uh, yes, Juanita, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Absolutely, uh, the idea of um, Latinx for Black lives would erase uh, Latinx people who are Black, um, yes. So um, thank you for bringing that in. Um, another example of like thinking really critically about like what's the full meaning of the phrase? Um, and, and I think just as a general rule, both as a white accomplice um, and an activist, but also as an artist is um, never getting so attached to our first idea that we aren't willing to change it if it doesn't end up being right, you know? Um, so thank you for that. Um, and then um, other ideas for graphics would be things for, um, for social media. Um, 
uh, a Facebook cover prof uh, cover photo, your profile picture, posts for your timeline, but then also thinking beyond that, thinking about, um, you know, maybe you put an, a graphic or a slogan or a message in your email signature. Um, maybe you put you have a blog or a website and you want to put that up as the, the primary graphic um, right now or forever, you know, things like that. Um, and if you're if you're really savvy with digital graphics, maybe you want to work tonight on the tablet and draw something up. Um, if you're not, you can always just take a picture of something with really high contrast and use it on your phone. Use some filters to really boost the saturation, boost the contrast, fill in the black, um, and create like a really stunning visual graphic that you could then use on social media. Um, so as we start going here, um, if you have ideas about things that you might want to make tonight, if you could just start putting those in the chat, um, that might be helpful to just jog other folks' ideas about what they might be able to make. Um, um, and, and yeah, and as I'm talking, if you like ask Anna, just ask a question about other IG profile picture ideas. Um, if anybody has ideas while I'm talking, please just like fill those in. This can be real, a real casual kind of thing right now. Um, and then as far as what you might be using tonight or while you're in quarantine, um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So materials. Um, the first example I'm gonna show is uh, someone who went into the alley and found a cardboard box and was like, I have to do something, right? I've got Sharpies, uh, I'm gonna turn a paper bag inside out and use the paper bag. Maybe you have scrap poster board lying around, construction paper, a t-shirt you don't care about anymore, uh, scraps of fabric, a mask cover, scrap pieces of, of canvas, um, and then also digital images can really, you could use any free app on your phone. You could take a picture of a drawing. Um, and then as far as materials for how to, how to paint or draw on that, really like anything that will go onto it is fair game. Um, and I actually think it's really lovely to be out in the streets with like very, very obviously homemade signage because we are like, it's just so punk to like be like, what I have is my body and this grocery bag, and I'm gonna bring this with me, and this is gonna be my statement. Um, there's something really beautiful about the aesthetics of that, um, I think. So um, a last couple considerations, and then I'll, I'll go through some slides where I have examples of DIY protest art from the last like two weeks. Um, and uh, so, so some things to think about, especially if it's gonna be a sign or a banner or something that you're taking in, uh, in public, but also maybe in private, um, most of these things have a front and a back. So you're holding a sign in a crowd, you've got the side of it that's maybe facing towards the media or the police or the bystanders, but then you've got the side of it that's like going back towards your friends in the, in the body of the protest. So can you play with a more like confrontational message on one side and a more uplifting, we can do this, we're in this together message for the other side. And then if the crowd turns and you realize that you need to flip it around, you can just flip it around. Um, so always thinking about like, it's a physical object, it lives in space, um, there's a front and a back. That's even true for something you put in your window. Um, putting a Black Lives Matter sign in your window is there blank room on the back of that material? Can you, can you remind yourself too every day of something that keeps you connected to the work? Because it's, it's sitting in your window. It's not just for them, it's also for us. Uh, them being like anybody walking by. Um, and then always thinking about who is your audience um, and who are you as the speaker? So for example, um, for me as a white person to say something like, I can't breathe, doesn't actually feel like the quote we started with in the beginning appropriate for me because uh, the reason I'm in this work is because I, I really, really can breathe. Like I do not have cops uh, choke holding me. Um, and so um, things that are, uh, there are certain statements that, that place a sort of first person in the experience of black people about I can't breathe, um, other ones that are not coming to the top of my mind right now, um, but, but that if you can't imagine yourself personally making that statement, then substitute it for one that you really do feel you could stand behind, um, that you would be comfortable saying to anybody at that protest, including the, the Black leadership. 
Um, and then just material considerations. This is where we can definitely, for those of you who want to stick around, we can help troubleshoot um, how to like DIY some lamination so that things stay waterproof if it's going to be raining, um, how to put in backing supports um, for uh, signs in the Chicago winds that get really uh, intense. Uh, so we can help you troubleshoot. I'm pretty good at MacGyvering those kinds of um, um, things and we can we can crowdsource it. So um, some examples in the chat. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Ruby. So hands up, don't shoot is a good example of something that doesn't make sense coming from a white person at a Black Lives Matter protest. Um, from Gertie, other examples, me, yeah, hands up, don't shoot. Um, David saying a small sandwich board um, with the statement, white guy showing up and then shutting up and listening. Yeah. Um, and like get funny about it, you know, um, especially if you're gonna be poking fun at yourself a little bit. Like here I am, not talking, right? Um, so um, yeah, whose streets, our streets, another example of something that, that's not appropriate for white people. Um, whereas um, community control over the police is something that we all can be invested in, for example. Um, or, no arrests, no rest. Like, I'm here for this movement, but, but when we get into things like um, um, owner, words, of, words of ownership and possessive pronouns, that's where it gets a little dicey. So um, keep coming with those examples too in the chat. Um, okay, so um, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, so we saw this one at the very beginning. So this is just like, this is scrap cardboard. Um, and uh, the nice thing about really good sturdy cardboard is that you can put it in your window. And then when you leave, you could put it on your bike rack or you could put it on your car window or you could carry it um, or you could leave it somewhere, you know? Um, so that's a, that's a great idea. Uh, the thing that's important here, uh, just like graphic design 101, high contrast is, absolutely your friend. So the thicker the lettering, the darker the marker, the bolder the, the bubble letters, those are your friends. Um, the paler a background and the darker the markers the, or vice versa. So if you wanted to use black fabric, get like thick white acrylic paint. So just high contrast thick lines are absolutely your friends. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Gotta love a pit bull picture. Um, so this is uh, someone who was making a mask cover uh, for herself uh, and had scrap fabric and decided to give uh, her dog Potato uh, a Black Lives Matter matching bandana. Um, Potato was a huge hit uh, at the protest that she went to. Um, and yeah, gotta love, a, gotta love a cute dog bandana. Um, uh, so a, que uh, a question from Magda in the um, in the chat question. Maybe it's no, Magda, there's no silly questions. Uh, if one of these statements that aren't really sensical for white people to chant, oh, are being chanted, is it also bad judgment to join in? Um, yeah, I think I see what you're saying. So like, for example, if it's not appropriate for me to put hands up, don't shoot on my sign, if I'm at a protest, and black leaders start the chant, hands up, don't shoot. Um, is it appropriate for me to join in on that chant? Um, I would love to talk about that further. Uh, yeah, um, good. Okay, so I understand Magda right. Um, I would love to talk about that further, um, maybe as soon as we break off into the, dis the discussion time. Um, and, and to Anna's question that just came up along with that, also like raising the black power fist. Um, I don't want to miss the nuance of that. So yeah, can we, is it okay if we, we table that for now? And I've got like two more slides. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, so yeah, if we want to go to the, the next slide, um, thinking about, so these were two things that people made at the workshop I did uh, with Spudnik. Uh, so the one person has a, like a, I don't know, a bishop's hat, like the, clergy hat thing that says Bibles are not props. 
Um, so uh, also to David's suggestion of, of a slogan for a sign, 1.7 billion for CPD, what the fuck, or seriously, like make it local and make it timely. You know, if you want to respond to a, a Trump photo op, which is what she was doing with this, um, if you want to make it super local to a local cause, those are always really good numbers to, to amplify, especially when the research is coming from Black leadership, um, like the, uh, the Black Lives Matter Chicago doing the research on the Chicago budget. Um, and then uh, here, another, a great example of a front and a back. So this is like a super DIY handmade, no justice, no peace, um, as a way of turning that phrase into something positive and generative that still retains the meaning of the N-O justice, N-O piece. Um, and then the last slide um, is actually by Manga. Um, and uh, and this, is, uh, this is mail art. So this is also like super great uh, to do targeted mail campaigns, um, flooding people's inboxes and then they just, and then they like figure out ways to filter it. And then you flood their voicemails and then the voicemail gets full. There is no shortage of space for them to deliver physical mail. Uh, so maybe you want to make cards that this was a, a birthday, happy birthday for Breonna Taylor campaign, uh, mailing birthday cards to the police department, the Louisville Police Department, um, to insist on the arrests of the officers who murdered her. Um, so, uh, banners, posters, signs, sandwich boards, digital graphics, mask covers, doggy bandanas, mail art, uh, the, the sky's the limit. Um, and I, I can share with you all uh, right before we wrap up my little project that I'm gonna do, which is I have my, I was seeing so many cute bike, biking people with uh, signs up and I have my like pannier that I clip on my rear rack. So tonight my project is gonna be putting something on this and then also finding a good way to attach it to my bike bag. That's my project. Um, I don't know what I'm going to put on my sign yet, so maybe we can workshop that. Um, yeah, thanks for tuning in. I guess I will let uh, Gwyneth or Latham wrap us up, and then um, anybody who wants to stick around and work on some protest art, um, it'd be fun to stay in chat. Thanks, Anders. Thank you. Um, just want to check, like, do we want to address those questions now or, yeah? So the question of um, uh, white folks joining in on a chant um, that's being led by black folks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I, would, I would love to know um, other people's ideas about this. Um, I, I feel like for me with the chance, um, yes, there's the rule about not saying things that don't really come from a white voice, um, but there's also the rule of following the leadership of the black activists I'm at the protest with um, and using my body to support like using my physical presence to support whatever that vision is. And if that vision is that 10,000 people are screaming, hands up, don't shoot. If, you know, 3,000 of us are white and we're silent, we've really diminished the power of that protest by not joining in the chant. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've, I've experienced a lot of times where the leadership, the organizers will specifically call out, okay, we want black people to speak up on this or to come forward for this or to have this moment, in which case it's very clear from the leadership, okay, that's not for me. Um, but I, but I, I do also want to respect, um, respect the, the leadership asking me to do, like they can see there's a bunch of white people in the crowd, like they can see we're there. Um, and so um, I feel like if, if, direction I'm gonna follow it if there's a, uh, a more specific direction I'm gonna leave that to other folks the the fist um, I personally don't I don't I don't often I don't really do the fist um, but I will put I will put my hand in the air 
um, and I and I'll 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 raise my hand in a kind of it's hard to let's see if I can do it, in a kind of like I see you I acknowledge you kind of gesture. Um, I'm open to pushback if people feel like that's not appropriate. Well, I think it, kind of, no. yeah, I just think this stuff is so contextual. I mean, because I, I also have always been somewhat uncomfortable with the fist and be like, oh, that's not for me. But then at protests very recently, it seems like people want me to do it. And so I'm sort of like, okay, well, I, I guess I'll do it. I'm a little uncomfortable, but it seems like everybody wants this to happen. So let's just play along. And I think, you know, it's also important for us to stretch our comfort levels and let these things be dynamic. Um, one sort of like practical thing that I would offer is that a lot of these um, chants are call and response. And sometimes the response or the call might feel more appropriate depending, you know, depending on your subject position. So I think, I think we should all be saying don't shoot, right? Like I, I, I you know, I think that there's a way in which that's like a, a call for all of us to make. Um, but I think it's, I think it's, there's also lots of ways to participate in protests that aren't raising your voice or raising your fist. And I think, um, you know, another thing that you can do is you can clap. Um, I think that's always a, that's a fun thing that I do sometimes when my voice gets tired or I just, Maybe I don't like the chant. Like I don't, I've always like struggled with the chant that's like send the killer cops to jail because I'm sort of like, well, if we're advocating for, you know, prison, like on one hand and then we're advocating against prison the next sentence, it feels a little out of sync. Um, but I get why people want that and I don't want to diminish what they're doing. So, uh, you know, so maybe I'll, I'll chant the part that's like, um, um, I forget the chant now, but- um, Oh, the one about send the killer cops to jail? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of, I think it's, I think this is like a messy, I think protest is messy, you know, also as part of it. And it's like the, it's, I think this was Audrey earlier who was talking about, you know, this like weird action that kind of took place at the end, but at the same time that it was like a total mess and like maybe kind of problematic, it also kind of, you know, yielded these results. And I think that's, that's the contradiction that we're kind of swimming in right now is that sometimes, um, sometimes sketchy stuff will <laughs> get the goods um, and sometimes doing everything the right way, um, you know, will be ignored. And I, and I don't know, um, there's all sorts of conditions at play, but um, yeah, I guess that was a rambly response, but I think this is a really great conversation because it's kind of something we don't talk about a lot is like, what is it, what kind of, um, how do we, protest is so collective, right? And, and um, but at the same time, we're really grappling with our difference right now. And so how do we kind of form a collective response for black life led by black folks, um, but not try to take up space and occupy um, a perspective that we can't fully embody and, um, but also support, you know, leadership. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's tricky, um, um, but it's, it's, yeah, Gwyneth, you go. And, and, and to that point, um, Sylvie asked, I'm also curious what y'all's opinions are on joining in on chants that a white person starts, even if it's a chant that's okay for white folks to say in the first place. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And I think that falls into some clearer territory because so much of the messaging from black leadership has been that white not be starting chant period. Um, and so the other thing about chants is that like, they actually take a lot of work to keep them going. Um, if you just fall, like I have a, I have a really loud voice <laughs> um, and I can pronounce really clear. Like, I feel like one of the things I like to do at protests is yell really loudly and pronounce every word really clearly to just like help the chant. And I have, personally gotten involved in like chants where I was like, this doesn't feel good anymore. And just the one loud person silencing themselves can be enough to kill it. Uh, so that's another thing to think about when you want to amplify a message. One loud person can really, really boost a chant. Um, but yeah, I feel like if it's started by a white person, it um, yeah, it's better to just leave it to the leadership yeah. is, my, I think, opinion um, about this then. I mean, I think it's also different to organize in Chicago where there are so many Black-led organizations. Um, I, I'm coming from Madison, Wisconsin, which is a very, very white city. 
and have been at protests where it was specifically white solidarity, um, in which case white people might be the main people starting a chant. So it's, it just can be, can be, you know. Yeah, and I think that that point that you're making, Anders, actually reminds me that that looking to leadership in these moments doesn't have to be like a direct one-to-one -one connection. It's like, what is the protest for? What it, what are what are the aims or the goals? Why why what is it re responding to? Um, is the work, as David and Ellen sort of said, that you're doing um, holding space for that and being of use to that sort of purpose? And I think that is a good sort of grounding message. It's like we don't, we won't necessarily always be able to run everything by, you know, um, leadership and be like, is this okay? And nor should we because that's exhausting, right? But I think we can, um, you know, try our best, feel through these things, and sort of take the cues from how, from the messages they're, they're giving to us. Um, on social media, around the protests, at the at the at the head of the protest line or at the march, you know. Yeah, there's a bit of a, a convo happening in the chat about like solidarity, um, like with the Black Power Fist, but not doing the fist. And so one person's suggesting the peace sign. One person's mentioning like putting fist on your chest. Um, I really, I don't, I don't really know um what's what's the right snaps sure mm -hmm. for a gay option <laughs> <laughs> cool thank you um jeremy so actually we um we can start moving and on maybe it's I know we are definitely over the time that we had said um, but Jeremy your question about organizing kind of feeds into um, what we were going to invite you all to do if you want um, but so it does this it does feel okay to move on here we, i've really i feel like this conversation could keep going obviously for a long time but i want to respect you all's time well why don't we why don't we go where we're going and then um i don't mind holding back a little bit if folks want to workshop or spitball or you know you know i don't mind holding back a little bit later for those who want to stay for that well same thank you all right well thank you all for joining us um we're about to wrap up and uh, want to honor your time, but feel free to stay after, obviously. So if you'd like to participate in a group text thread aimed at providing a support network for ongoing anti-racist work, please enter your phone number with the area code in the chat. Um, and then you can always opt out later down the line. Um, we are going to be, we're able to like keep the record of this chat. So, and we'll keep your number on file. Um, but with, with this thing and also with um, just our documentation and stuff like that, just want to ask everyone to be patient with us because we are doing the most right now and trying to do it all, um, you know, with care. So just give us, if you don't hear from us, it's, it's not that we forgot. It's just, you know, always feel free to reach out, but it's probably just, we just haven't gotten to it yet, but we will. All right, and um, oh, oh, this is me. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we are going to post again the resource toolkit um, in the chat, and you know, this is just a good document. Maybe one of those tabs you just leave open forever because it will. Um, we will be adding to it as we go. Um, I want to definitely get in the stuff that David and Ellen shared. I know Anders probably has some stuff that they want to put in there as well. Um, and I, there was some really juicy stuff in the chat too. So we'll try to kind of get all that up there when we can. It's also the place that we will post, one of the many places that we will post the documentation from tonight. So if there was something useful you want to come back and revisit, um, it will be there. Um, so that should be in the chat. Um, and then we're also going to send out a brief survey. It, um, it'll go out around 10 o'clock tomorrow. So, you know, um, let us know how we're doing. We've got four, three more of these. Um, and uh, are trying to, you know, uh, improve as we go. Um, 
And then just a final plea for folks to um, uh, donate to the Trans Women of Color Collective, um, and we'll um, shoot that, um, that donate page into the link. Um, really, it's a really important time, obviously. It's always an important time to support our um, trans uh, family, but in particular right now, um, particularly trans people of color and trans black folks, so, um, which is who that um, organization is by and for. So 